Who is Jekyll? What is Jekyll about? And what philosophies are at the core of Jekyll's content? These are questions that I've been asking myself recently as a result of the negative feedback that I received after making my own video harshly criticizing a video by Funky Frogbait. And although that is not what this video is about, that is where the formulation of this video started. After a couple of days, I was starting to feel as if people weren't getting the point of the video, to which I started asking myself the question, did I fail to articulate my points properly? Then I realized that a lot of the feedback that I was receiving was from people that had never seen any of my content before. A lot of this feedback was intending to be constructive criticism, trying to suggest that video essays are supposed to be between 10 to 20 minutes, 30 at absolute most. But the video wasn't a video essay. All of this made me realize that I myself don't know how to YouTube in any semblance of the standard formulas of YouTubing and what it means to be a YouTuber. Which made me look myself in the mirror and ask the question, do I actually want to be a YouTuber or do I simply want to create content where YouTube hosts my content? And I think that's a very important question. And that's when I realized I am standing against an entirely mountainous and seemingly insurmountable YouTube content creation standard that I have no interest in adhering to. Then I'm asking myself, how did we get here? To which I'm asking you, do you have 90 minutes? <laughs> And I say that not only to reference Jacksepticeye, a much larger and much more beloved content creator than myself, but because I know I have a habit of getting long-winded, and I know the points that I want to bring up in this video, but as it stands, I have no idea how long it's going to take us to get there. So I'm assuming it's going to be around 90 minutes. With that being said, let's start all the way back in 2007, where this first started for me with a content creator by the name of Kyle Monkey. Kyle Blanchard, AKA Kyle Monkey, got some notoriety making a couple of viral funny videos all the way back in 2007, which is when I was introduced to a very specific and particular video, which I'm looking for here currently, by the name of ADHD Chipmunk 2, Extremely Funny. Uploaded on December 5th of 2006, ADHD Chipmunk 2 Extremely Funny would be a video that I would come to familiarity with in the early to late spring of 2007, currently sitting at 2,295,687 views. This is still one of my favorite videos to this day. Oftentimes ridiculed for having a Jim Carrey-like approach to comedy, I don't think Kyle really thought or gave a shit about the way that his content would change the shape of YouTube and influence a lot of early content creators moving forward. With other videos such as You Will Piss Your Pants If You Watch This, as well as one of my own personal favorites, if I can find it. Kyle Monkey Kitchen Edition. Kyle's content came to us during a time when there wasn't exactly a set standard, nor was there a need for there to be a set standard of what content creation on YouTube was supposed to look like. He was just filming himself, goofing it off, running it through an editor to speed up everything and throw clips together and upload it for his friends. And that content was funny enough that it caught wind like wildfire. It came to us during a time where other video hosting platforms were realizing that it might not be a bad idea to host their videos onto YouTube, such as Newgrounds or Albino Black Sheep. But we were also in an era where the government was trying to regulate the internet and what is trafficked on the internet some of the notable sites around this time can include Bonsai Kitten or Rotten.com. And YouTube also knew this as a company. 
So when it came time to test out a creator program where content creators who are large enough, who could qualify to monetize their content, some of these regulations were embedded into what it takes to monetize your content as an independent content creator. Some of my personal favorites from around this time, such as Shane Dawson, Destry Smith, Matt G, and Smosh, would go on to be paving the way for what content creation could look like as successful independent content creators. But the thing that is oftentimes overlooked is that before any of the people from this area, whether I include them or not, were only people who were uploading content to entertain their friends and by happenstance just so wound up becoming professionals on YouTube. This incentivized other independent content creators, whether they've been uploading for a long time or they were aspiring looking up to these content creators to move forward and make content that resembled theirs or at least matched a similar level of professionality. That way they too could turn the internet into their income and their profession. And it wouldn't be long before we all became very familiar with the concepts of copyright and fair use and what exactly that entails, if for no other reason than the large public coverage of Ethan and Ella Klein of H3H3 being sued for copyright infringement and winning that case being a huge victory for content creators all over the country and the platform at large. With this, we had a set standard of what content creation was going to look like and what content creators were supposed to do if they wanted to find success on the platform that is YouTube. With all of this precedent being set in stone and in motion, there were a lot of content creators that were cropping up, making content, turning YouTube and other forms of social media into viable, livable, wage-granting, and bearing options. And then alas, as fate would have it, the standard would change again in real time as soon as Vine got shut down. Now, even though there was already some advertisement-related issues that YouTube was dealing with for the fact that advertisements were being featured on problematic videos such as those surrounding conspiracy theories or even videos produced by white supremacist groups or white supremacist sentiments, this put the pressure on YouTube as a company to more strictly regulate what they were doing and what they were allowing advertiser branded content to be featured in conjunction with the content that was being put on YouTube. Now with all of this going on, this made it feel like a lot of the already established YouTubers that had already made a name for themselves, even paving the way for YouTube to have the notoriety that it already did, were now facing the punishment as brands were no longer allowing for their advertisements to be on certain types of content. On top of all of this, there was a Viner invasion where a whole bunch of independent content creators were coming over from another platform that currently no longer existed because the plug had just been pulled on it, and those content creators did not give a damn about the way the standards and the things that had been done, the th history that led content creation to be the way that it was on YouTube, and they were just making whatever kind of content that they wanted in comparison to the now strictly regulated, long-standing YouTubers. <sighs> And a lot of what was being popularized and having brand deals and advertisements placed on it was demonstrably bad behavior by people such as Gabby Hanna and the Paul brothers. But this made a whole bunch of Viner clones, which now have been affectionately referred to as douche tubers, to be profiting off of their bad behavior, not being punished in quite the same way that the already long-standing content creators that had made a name for themselves on YouTube were now facing that criticism and YouTube was letting them get away with it. Up until a fateful day in January of 2018 when Logan Paul uploaded a video where he went into Aokigahara Forest and the thumbnail on that video featured the recently deceased body of somebody who had passed away under unfortunate circumstances in that forest. And that was exactly when all hell broke loose, because in spite of the fact that these long-standing content creators were no longer making the same money that they were, and then over here are incredibly bad actors 
who do not care about the standard, coming in and trampling all over everything, writing dicks on it, getting into all kinds of legal trouble, and still making profit off of that content, in spite of the standard that they were being held to, this led to a whole bunch of commentary where people were criticizing YouTube and criticizing the standard, and now they themselves had to be put to that standard to not sound like a hypocrite, and now these standards are going left and right, and people are getting canceled for being hypocrites, people are being held accountable for their shady, heinous, past behaviors, and people are also getting taken out and being deplatformed for things that they said years and years ago and had not apologized for, and oh my god, it's a fucking train wreck. And as the years have gone on, eventually things settled down and people wound up finding out the hard way, one way or another, what it takes in the new Wild West wasteland that YouTube had become. Now, I know, I know, this is a very brief and very oversimplified oversimplification, which bears redundance. <laughs> of what actually happened, what actually went down, and what actually took place. There are things that happened that I didn't account for here. There are things that I didn't account for it because I'm unaware that it happened. But this is a brief overview of the things that took place that I myself have been pretty privy to and have informed the way that I myself am conducting content here. And that's the part of why it's important in this video. There are things that I did not account for in this video. I'm not trying to exclude anything. But an oversimplified history of the complexities of how the YouTube standard has been set is all I really got right now. <laughs> now, it's something that I think personally, and I may be wrong altogether, about what has happened to YouTube in the wake of all of this happening is that now there aren't a whole lot of top-tier, big-name YouTubers unless they have always been top-tier, big-name YouTubers. What we have now is a whole bunch of slightly smaller content creators, whether that's anywhere between 1,500 to 3 million subscribers, or you have completely unique niche followings that are a part of niche communities where they are popular in that community, but not really anywhere else on the platform. Which means that there are different precedents and different standards depending on the community or the content creator themselves or the community that they are a part of that isn't really... It winds up not really being fair by blanketing one standard over all of YouTube when there are people who have definitely demonstrably proven that there are multiple models for success on YouTube. Now, I want to point at one of the criticisms that I've received recently because I have an example as to where that criticism isn't an end-all, be-all model, and that is the suggestion that video essays should only be between 10 to 20 minutes, 30 at most. And to prove this point that that's not exactly the end-all, be-all standard, I want to bring up Super Eyepatch Wolf. Super Eye Patch Wolf is a video essayist here on YouTube who has been talking mostly about pop culture things, particularly anime and manga, and his very first video, Why You Should Watch Hunter x Hunter, was 49 minutes long. And although, as we go on, they wind up getting shorter, such as the Why You Should Watch One Punch Man being 26 minutes and 55 seconds, Let's Talk Phantom World, 14 minutes and 18 seconds, we eventually go on seeing what he's talking about, talking about what he loves, and some of the standout ones that I personally have come to love, such as How Media Scares Us, the work of Junji Ito, is only 22 minutes and 53 seconds long. However, as he gets more confident in his craft and goes on, they wind up getting longer. Most of these are still fitting that formula of anywhere between 15 and 35 minutes. And then we reach this one, The Impact of Final Fantasy VII, the game that changed everything, where he spends 49 minutes, nearly an hour, talking about how awesome Final Fantasy was and how it changed the gaming industry forever. There's another one here that I'd like to point out, where on the thumbnail it says, I'm sorry, and it has Ichigo Kurosaki on it. The Fall of Bleach, four years later, where he takes the time to follow up and make a sequel to a video that he made years before talking about the fall of Bleach, where he goes back, revises some things, changes his opinion on others, corrects a few mistakes, but still eventually sticks to his guns on his original sentiment. 
And then we have this deep dive of what the internet did to Undertale, coming in at 39 minutes and 15 seconds. And then we have this one, the bizarre world of fake psychics, coming at 47 minutes and 10 seconds. And if you are one of my witchy followers, I highly recommend this one. And then we have this magnum opus of a video essay, What the Internet Did to Garfield, where he spends one hour and nearly 20 minutes talking about the history of Garfield, how Garfield started, and how the internet ruined Garfield, and then turned him into something even more beautiful, but not before he became something monstrous, somewhat of an eldritch terror. Now pardon me as we go through a little bit of a hyperdrive of content pointing outing. What is Nathan Fielder? An hour long. Then we have Horror in Impossible Places talking about liminality, liminal space imagery, as well as what is liminal horror, coming in at 49 minutes and 43 seconds long. And then this one right afterwards, Chainsaw Man is a goddamn masterpiece, where he spends an hour and 13 minutes talking about how awesome Chainsaw Man is and why you should fucking watch it! And then, to tie off my point, we have the unreality of pro wrestling, talking about kayfabe and the story of Roman Reigns. And then... We also have another one following up the last two videos on The Simpsons, asking the question, is Simpsons good again? Both of them over an hour long. Both of them incredibly personal passion projects. And this man, by the internet name of Super Eye Patch Wolf, has 1.72 million subscribers. Are you seeing what I'm getting at here? Other than shamelessly and egregiously plugging one of my favorite content creators on this platform, what I am trying to point out is that although, for the most part, Super Eye Patch Wolf still sticks to this basic between 15 and 35 minutes for a video essay, there are others that are still long and drawn out and have a lot of points to get to, and it's worth that hour to an hour and a half worth of content in order to make a good video to cover all of the points and get to why these are the things that he loves. It also points out that there isn't one standard acceptable model for what it takes to make a successful video essay. And although Super Eye Patch Wolf got there after years of fitting a standard model and then had the option to have a little bit of wiggle room to make longer videos, I binged almost all of his content and I didn't find him until the Liminal Horror video, which is the entire reason why... Hang on. Got it right over here. Hang on. One sec is the entire reason why I have this book, House of Leaves, by Mark D. Mark Z. Danielewski. I got a whole goddamn book, although I have yet to read it, it is exactly because of Super High Patch Wolf. God damn me. Yes, I realize I'm cringe. That's part of the appeal. And after all this time in this video, I still haven't gotten to the point. This has all just been prefaced so far as to why I make content the way that I do. And what is kind of the philosophy that drives me to continue making content the way that I do? I am somebody who has spent the last 15 years watching YouTube content, and I have fallen in love with several different facets of YouTube culture, very much being an enthusiast of the history of YouTube, watching the way that YouTube has changed and evolved over the years, trying to stay aware of it at least to some extent. And it is one of my favorite things to talk about. No, anybody who knows me in my real life can attest to this, that I talk about social media way more than anybody should who wants to consider themselves healthy. I have also watched as YouTube 
started off as a place where people could just film themselves being goofballs, upload it to the internet, share it to their friends, and maybe somehow along the way, they wound up gaining some sort of minor fame, celebrity, or notoriety, whether it be at large or simply in their own communities on the internet. I have watched as people have risen and fallen. I have watched as this platform has changed shape and the entire landscape has sh shaped a new horizon that nobody expected and nobody anticipated, but because of the way that we adapt to changing conditions, YouTube is still here. And we are still here on YouTube. And as things have gone further, as the entire progress has gone on. YouTube has become more and more inaccessible to the average person and the average viewer. Part of the standard model of YouTube expectations would suggest that you need to have a very specific type of background that emulates you but is your background for your videos. The standard YouTube model of success would point out that you need to have a certain type of camera, or in the very least, this level of quality camera, and you need to have this type of editing program, or at least something that is of that standard of editing program software. You need to do things this way. You need to set this standard. You need to adhere to the way that other people are doing it if you want success. And although these things are very successful, they are tried and true, and they work time and again, but it's made YouTube more and more inaccessible to people like me who don't have the money to put into this. I'm filming from my phone camera. I am working on a laptop that I got at the beginning of 2019, and here we are in April of 2024. And both are on their last leg, and I don't know how many months I have left with either of them. And once they both go to shit, I don't know where my next form of technology is coming from, because I don't know how I'm going to afford it. And I have been inspired by the people that were like me in these situations, in these positions, that don't have a lot of money, and continued to make it work some way, somehow. Even if that meant that they had to go on for years using subpar, substandard equipment. But the whole point that made me fall in love with YouTube was to begin with, was because it's YouTube. And when we are looking at more successful content creators who do have this standard issue because they are able to afford it and they fit this model and they have a way of doing things, there are a couple of things that wind up happening. Number one, we wind up setting an unreal expectation for people who want to make YouTube. And we wind up enforcing that unrealistic expectation on up and coming YouTubers who wanna make something out of this. And all we are doing is enforcing them the idea that they can't do it because they're too broke because of situations and circumstances that may or may not be out of their control. And number two, we are staunching one of the number one popular ways for people to express their creativity and making it more limited for people to express themselves creatively and artistically. What do I mean by that? Because of the standard that has been set, because of these guidelines and these blueprints that have been laid out courtesy of those that came before us, we now have it set up so that YouTube content is a dime a dozen you're gonna find one video that looks almost identical to another video. And don't get me wrong, there is a sense of security, there is a comfortability in the fact that popular content creators wind up making content that looks very similar, although they, as individual content creators, have different points, different takeaways, different subjects, and different ways to getting about their own conclusions. It winds up looking the same, even though it's not the same. And there is a comfortability in that. There is a familiarity in that. But if that is all that is allowed, then what the hell are we doing? We're not giving a space or a platform for people to be different or creative in harmless ways that affect literally nobody in a negative way. I have seen it in the film criticism and analysis community, where basically what, what ends up happening is nobody ever shows their face, they're all showing clips of a video using excerpts from articles in order to talk about why a movie sucked or why in spite of it sucking, it was still good, 
or maybe the movie that they're talking about was a hidden gem. But whatever winds up happening is that it all looks the same, there's still the same monotone type of voice going over it, and there's always the same standard of film criticism that people are going on about it, which is setting a standard for everybody else to determine for themselves, in spite of their own beliefs, whether a movie is good or not. I've seen this happen in the witchcraft and occult community, where even though we have different people who are having their different practices and their different experiences and their different belief structures talking about their own personal experience and the way that they've come to their own certain conclusions, it still winds up being set up where people are sitting there with a tiny little microphone talking very close to the mic where it gives a little bit of an ASMR simulation, and then with that... It all winds up looking the same because it's the same type of camera pointing at them at the same kind of angle where they're just talking about the thing in the same kind of ways where it fits the same formula it all winds up looking the fucking same there's no difference it's all bland gray things that wind up forming together and there's not a lot for people to stand out amongst the crowd and it winds up just blending all together like this sewn in static where I myself am asking, what is the difference between this content creator and this content creator? And now with this, we are asking other people to do that same thing and fit in with that mold. And we are asking other people who might have completely different aspirations, influences, and inspirations, and asking them to be like everybody else because that's what works. And this leads me to the conclusion that in many instances, when somebody makes a reaction video and it doesn't fit that mold, or somebody makes a video essay and it doesn't fit that mold, the comments are telling them that they're doing it wrong. When there's nothing wrong about what they're doing, it's just different than that standard mold. So now people are getting a feedback telling them they shouldn't do it or they should change the way they want to do it. They should fit their creative expression to a specific mold. And what is that really doing for anybody? I would like to take a look over here at my laptop and look at the comment section to focus on one specific comment thread in the reaction video that I made to Funky Frog Bait's video. Now the point is not to bring up that again, but it is where this comment is coming from to continue upholding the point that I'm trying to make. And what is the point? And also, why does the subscriber number matter? If anything, out of that large number of viewers, some might choose to follow you simply to see what the fuck you're going to say next. Asses and pews and all that. To which I respond with this gargantuan novel of a response. Sigh. Then they will be disappointed and leave when I don't say much next. And I'm not sure what I'm going to accomplish by responding, but here goes. The point was, a larger content creator with X amount of subscribers put a whole bunch of content creators in front of that large following in order to make fun of them. It's punching down and that sucks. Because now those smaller content creators are put in the line of fire and potential danger. And at the end, I go on about spiritual psychosis because that's a huge thing that people get harassed over. Before the video these comments are under, my last most video was less than 800 views, and for a long time I have been on the witchy side of TikTok where this is what I do. Sit down, take grievance, explain my point, try to provide context and elaborate, and the reason this video is a lot like that is because I made it for my audience. Maybe I don't get YouTube and how things work, and that's why this video didn't make sense to many people and was so ill-received, and is why people think I have motivations that I simply don't. I saw something that I thought was unfair, and I addressed it, and I spent an hour pleading that case. You want to know what I've been doing since I made this video? I did a comment response video going back over some of the points in this one in a much shorter time, but also explaining what the problem actually was. Then I reintroduced myself to 1,300 subscribers in two parts, one being a reintroduction and the other being an hour-long channel tour. Then I spent days filming and editing an Egoverse-style video where multiple characters talk about chaos magic. I don't think any of that constitutes as me trying to make more content anything like this video, because since then, I just want to go back to making the silly, stupid, cringy shit I've been doing since 2017. The point of this video? To talk about something I didn't think was fair, which was that a larger content creator was punching down on smaller content creators, and then explain why it isn't fair, and that there is unintended detrimental consequences that fall onto those smaller content creators because they've been declared as unsound of mind before a decently sizable following. And with that, I hope this helps. Now, before I carry on, I've got a question for you. 
Could you tell that at some point in this video that a whole day had passed and that I had showered in that time? No, probably not. Not unless you're able to look at the context clues around me in the background and the backdrop and maybe you would notice that my hair is just a little bit cleaner than it was previously. But I'm wearing the same clothes. My camera is in the same position. The background, for the most part, is pretty much the same. But if I had not pointed it out, my clothes are the same, my face is the same, my hair is in the same style, and I'm still at the forefront, bringing your attention to me, taking you away from the differences between then and now, especially since it's the same video. Now, with that being said, I feel it's safe to suggest that unless something is pointed out to you, you might not notice. And if you aren't aware of the things around you and the people that you meet and greet and the people that you completely aren't aware of, it may not ever come to your attention if it's not pointed out to you. In March of 2022, I made a video here titled, I'm Leaving Witch Talk. And at the time, I completely fucking meant it. But in the course of that video, I wind up explaining some of my complaints and grievances as to what is a driving factor of me leaving Witch Talk and why I'm fed up. With that being said, a huge talking point in that video was echo chambers and how the TikTok algorithm turns communities into echo chambers. To explain what I'm getting at here, think of it this way. A community is a living, thriving thing. People of a like mind or of some kind of similarity are together talking about something and hopefully together they communicate and build and grow. Sometimes you have subcultures that come out of that community that with any luck became a culture. Some communities become a subculture in and of themselves, but those communities build and grow and sometimes they devolve and a lot of infighting makes separate ideations, but it grows, it lives and it thrives and it continues on. And echo chambers are one of the things that make communities die. Because in an echo chamber, we're taking that group of people, throwing them in a contained area. Think of it like a glass jar. You take this group of people, you put them in a glass jar, and whether it's because of major talking points, whether it's because of algorithmic exchanges putting something in your face, the same points come up over and over and over, and people argue about the same things over and over and over, and the same regurgitated information winds up being swapped back and forth and nothing really grows from that. It just becomes the same old, same old, boring, bland thing that's staunched of all expression and ability to grow because it's now in this echo chamber that is killing the potential for any kind of growth. And an echo chamber can happen to or within any community. And if you aren't a part of a community, that community can wind up looking like an echo chamber from the outside looking in because the loudest and most violent and boisterous voices wind up being the main talking points that get amplified over and over and over. But once you get to the actual inside and meet of the community, you will realize there actually is a rich, thriving culture inside of that ego chamber that has managed to survive and thrive in spite of the bullshit. That also means that you have to be a part of that community for an extended period of time in order to get to that actual juicy, nutritious center. And that's why I made that video. Being a part of that community for going on four years, there were a lot of things that were unfair that I felt needed to be pointed out as a member of that community because the outside isn't going to be aware of the ways in which that video has potential detrimental ramifications when you put people in front of that many subscribers. That was the whole point. But I feel as if the way that the current YouTube standard of what constitutes as the acceptable means in which somebody should produce YouTube content to get some semblance of professionality across, that way they can make a living on this platform, either is or has already created an echo chamber and the communities are dying because now these communities that are representing and are a part of these bigger, larger content creators are now enforcing a standard that some people 
might not even be giving a shit about when they're making their own content. But if you are coming to another content creator and assuming that they are operating under those same rules and regulations and standards, you are going to come to conclusions that do not accurately represent the person that you're talking to. And maybe this is going to lead me to one of the silver linings as to why formulaic, cut and dry, run in the mill content that feels very copy and paste to me specifically actually has some merit to it. Because if you are going by a formula and sticking to a regulated way of making content, then people can watch your videos and then they don't have to figure out who you actually are behind the mask. Then people don't have to figure out what your values actually are. You can just make content, put it out there, and a whole bunch of people can appreciate and not give a fuck about you, which makes your content then easily consumable to a larger demographic because it's now spreading across multiple demographics. But it's a double-edged sword. Not only is it upholding an idea of a standard that now whole entire communities and followers and subscriber bases of larger content creators are now enforcing, therefore, directly or indirectly, deliberately or accidentally, staunching creativity as well as artistic growth and innovation. It's also putting acceptable YouTube content at an unreachable and inaccessible standard. It makes it so people who want to become YouTubers but don't know where to start think that they need to start off with this type of camera or this type of backdrop and sometimes they simply cannot achieve those things. So if they want to do it, all they have is their own gusto and gumption and just their own camera on their phone to stand in front of a mirror and give long-winded video essays that make the entire thing seem that much more accessible. And that is what I am doing. That comment conversation that I read off just a few minutes ago feels like a perfect example of everything that I'm trying to get at since I read that conversation off. Somebody who is much more accustomed to a different standard of YouTube content creation than what I myself am producing here sees what I'm doing and based off of the one video that they see about me comes to a conclusion that is completely removed from my motivations because what I am doing, my understanding, my background, and my motivations are not the same as what the average YouTuber would have as their motivations. And I could sit here and carry on and make it sound so much more like a poor me situation. I am trying to use the examples that I have received in order to point to a much larger issue that I think is taking place. And that conclusion is... I don't know if there is space for content like mine to become popular or successful on this platform. Something that I've talked about here, as well as on TikTok, is something that I refer to as social media kayfabe. Now, kayfabe is a term that's usually used in regards to pro wrestling. We know wrestling is fake, we know it's staged and rehearsed, and we also know that the person who is wrestling is performing a character in order to perform a long-form narrative storytelling form of media where wrestling and settling things in the ring is the medium through which these stories are able to be told. And in order to get by, this kayfabe is actually a suspension of disbelief, that way we can be entertained and listen to and buy into the story that is being told. We can see this taking place in social media, when there are people who are performing a character that is a social media persona. They have a character that they are performing for the audience, that way they can entertain their audience, and then they can go back home, turn the camera off, and just be themselves. Now, before I continue on, I think it's important to make note that just because I make reference to a content creator here does not mean that I support them in any way whatsoever, but I am using those examples because they are popular examples to utilize as jumping points. PewDiePie is actually Felix Shelberg. Jacksepticeye is actually Sean McLaughlin. Markiplier is actually Mark Fishbach. And if you thought some of these creators were actually using their real names, well, let's look no further than Destry Smith, who is actually Destry Moore, and Sh Shane Dawson, who is actually Shane Yaw. They all have a 
character that they perform or did perform for their audience in order to entertain the people that were continuing to watch their content. As some of the people that I mentioned wound up being outed or canceled for being disingenuous or outright scumbags, there was a push for audiences to want more genuine and real feeling content from their content creators, which is how we had a rise in prominence in content creators such as Emma Chamberlain or David Dobrik. Then because these people were using what at least appeared to be their real names, and yet still performing a social media character, when it was outed that David Dobrik was not who he actually presented himself to be, people were heartbroken. And I don't know if he got cancelled, but he wound up falling completely out of relevance, and there are a lot of people that for whatever reason now don't fucking like him anymore. Because behind the social media persona that felt to be more genuine and felt to be more like a real person, it still was presented and proven to be that the character of David Dobrik wasn't the real David Dobrik. And this also helps me to understand at least a little bit, whether I agree with it or not, why there is such an appeal to people and YouTubers and social media personalities such as the Paul brothers. Jake and Logan Paul are still relevant. As I'm filming this today, Jake Paul is getting ready to fight Mike fucking Tyson. And Logan Paul is now a professional wrestler in the WWE. They maintain relevancy because they were upfront about being douchebags. They got in to a lot of trouble. They were class acts in bad behavior. And in spite of all of the criticism and all of the backlash, their bad behavior and them being bad boys of the YouTube world made that feel so much more genuine than anything else that was being presented via YouTube. And that makes them all the more appealing. And now they have been able to find lives and careers outside of YouTube and still maintain relevancy today. It works and it's effective because in the very least, at least their bad behavior is genuine and they're not making too many excuses for it. As for a personal reason as to why I keep bringing up the idea of social media kayfabe is by the fact I'm not Jaquel. Jaquel is a character. I'm Ethan. And as Ethan, I'm the host of a DID system. Four of my alters, myself included, help me to make the content that is a part of the Jaquel idea. Another thing about me is that I am a female alter in my DID system. I wind up telling people that I am trans, feminine, non-binary. But my gender is actually a lot more complicated than that, and I don't feel like taking the time to explain it here. I'm a female alter running around in an AMAB meat suit. And that's what I'm stuck with. And I still deal with some of the crap to this day where I am making content for TikTok, where I'm wearing a women's shirt and somebody comes along and it's just like, what are you? They know what the fuck is going on. They're being transphobic. And none of this needs to matter for my content because that's not what any of my content is about. None of this is what I talk about here. I don't talk about being a system. I don't talk about being trans. I make mention to it, sure, but that's not what I'm dedicating whole entire videos about. So being able to cooperate with multiple headmates in my system in order to bring about a character for the sake of social media, in order to entertain as many people as we possibly can is what's more important to us with the kind of content we are trying to make. And going along with the idea of social media kayfabe, that's how myself and my other headmates are able to perform videos where it is a part of a Jaquel egoverse, where multiple members of my system, myself included, get to perform different characters for the sake of short little snippets in a video to get from point A to point v B. And yes, it is worth mentioning that this Jaquel egoverse is inspired by content creators like Markiplier and Jacksepticeye, but it is also inspired by the other 
characters that have inspired us previously. It is also inspired by our own form of humor and comedy and satire, where we embody characters to be entire tropes of things that we see to point out to people sometimes this thing that we're talking about is silly. It is also inspired by the content creators that inspired us, that led us to want to make content here to begin with. Another thing that I think is worth mentioning is that I started off doing this in 2017, and I tried, and I tried, and then I got to about 2021 after having already spent about a year lurking on TikTok before I myself started making my own TikTok content. And it was a completely different thing than what I was doing here to begin with. And even after four years, almost four years, of being a content creator over on TikTok, and then pulling away from TikTok and making more content over here again, I feel as if TikTok helped make me a better content creator, but it did not make me a better YouTuber. And there are a lot of ways where my content here is influenced by the content that I've been making over at TikTok. But because of that, I'm not sure if there's going to be a lot of people that are understanding that I'm pointing to the thingy and asking people to consider supporting the channel. There's something that I started doing over on TikTok because it works. Because by doing that, it's the only way that I've been able to get by and survive. And perhaps that's part of the problem also, is because although TikTok and YouTube are both popular video sharing platforms, they are two completely, wildly different entities. So if I bring the stuff that I've been doing over on TikTok over to YouTube, it might not make a whole lot of sense, because TikTok and YouTube have been kept separate for the longest amount of time, which makes me feel like... Pardon the interruption, but I regret to inform you that the TikTokers are already coming. Mmm. Oh, excuse me. I was going to talk about TikTok. TikTok started off as another application known as music.ly, which was moderately popular, people knew about it, but I'm not sure if there were a whole lot of people that were actually uploading to it, until it was bought out by another company and was rebranded as TikTok. At first, there wasn't a lot of people that were really knowing about it or talking about it. If anybody knew about it, they were referring to it as a Vine 2.0, and it wound up being a little bit of a cringe fest. And that became the stuff of the YouTuber abroad. Across the board? Is that what I was trying to go for? Hmm. YouTubers across the board were having a heyday of finding TikTok content to make fun of and point out that it was quite the example of cringe. TikTok was an application that nobody really took seriously until the pandemic swept the globe and people were now going into their homes on lockdown. And TikTok was there to bring everybody together. Some downloaded it at first as a joke, others out of pure and simple boredom because they had nothing else to do with their time. But as time went on, with the incredibly sophisticated algorithm of the TikTok application, People were quickly brought together with like minds based on what they were liking, based on what they were sharing, based on the hashtags that they had a common interest in. People were brought together and communities were being formed and information was being spread in real time in ways that no other form of media had been able to do before. And this was a blessing and a curse. Because you see, TikTok isn't all sunshine and rainbows, because it has a reputation for suppressing content put out by the LGBTQIA+, people of color trying to bring social awareness to certain issues. There are definitely a long-standing series of stories about how people have done something that they didn't know was entirely wrong, and yet they were still shadow banned for reasons indiscernible. There are bugs in the system, one can say, and a flagging system and a reporting system that less than savory individuals wind up exploiting and taking advantage of. But it has also done one thing. 
It has brought more people together than any other form of social media that I myself am currently aware of. Going across the entire world, people from all walks of life are now able to come together and share their own life stories and experiences, their own common interests, the things that they are interested in, a platform where anybody can share whatever the hell they want so long as it does not violate the guidelines and the rules and regulations. Anybody can talk about almost anything. And there's a market for that. But with this rapid sharing of information in real time, there are certain issues that certain legislative bodies might have an issue with, which is exactly why now in the United States, TikTok is facing being banned. And I'm not going to talk about that particular bill right now because there are far more sinister implications that that bill would present than I or you have the time for covering here and now. But it bears insisting TikTok could get banned. And at the time of my filming this, there is a verdict that is still out on that. But in spite of that, whether it stays or whether it goes, the TikTokers are coming. And the TikTokers have already started to cross over onto YouTube. In spite of the issues with the ever-changing landscape of YouTube, it's at least been here for quite some time which provides a sense of stability that TikTok simply does not. Because this isn't the first time that people have had complaints and grievances about TikTok. People aren't able to make money the way that they wish that they could on TikTok. People aren't able to promote their own things the way that they wish they could on TikTok. TikTok, for a lot of people, either is a primary or a supplementary social media stream of revenue that helps them to promote their content into other places or is in conjunction with what they're doing on other platforms. And as the way it looks, from the point of time I'm looking at, TikTok isn't reliable, nor is it stable, and certainly not is it sustainable. Which means, whether we like it or not, the TikTokers are coming. And with them, they are going to bring their TikTok way of doing things. They're going to bring their TikToker sentiments. And they are not going to give a good goddamn about the way things have been conducted here on YouTube. They're going to do things their way. They aren't going to make space for the standards that have already been set. And where have I seen this before? Oh yeah, with the Viner invasion. We've seen this happen before, not too long ago in the history of some of our collective memories. And when the Viners invaded, that changed the entire landscape and platform for the better or for the worst. Which means that when the TikTokers come, this platform is going to change. So if you feel you must, Hold on to the standards and the type of content that you yourself have found to be favorable. Hold on to it. Keep it close and safe for as long as you can. Because at some point in the not too distant future, it's going to be gone. Just like everything else. Oh, and yes, I am aware that I make cringe content. That was a character by the name of Darren T. Smith, and he is older than Jaquel. He is older than the Egoverse. He is older than YouTube itself. He is my first original character that I initially made as a comic book character. But as I became invested in that character, he became something else entirely. Even to such an extent that I myself, before I was the host of my DID system, would refer to myself as Darren. Now, that Darren isn't me. That Darren is something else. And he has a bit of a mind of his own. You see, the thing about Darren is... He is self-aware. And he knows that he's a character. He knows that he's got a role to perform. And he loves performing that role. Which is the ultimate antagonist. You see, I realized that Darren was self-aware when I tried bringing him to the channel all the way back in 2018. For evidence of this, he exists in two videos that I made all the way back in 2018 
the Halloween Hangover, and the Holiday Hangover. But there were other videos that he was in, other videos that he himself directed. And I realized that he was trying to take over my channel. So I pulled the plug, and some of those videos don't even exist anymore. But he's been here, and he's been around, watching the entire thing as it happens. And I'll tell you this much, Darren himself is still a mystery to me. Because he is self-aware, he is sentient, and he is cognizant. But he also knows that if he wants to play along, he has to cooperate at least a little bit. And that is something that he hasn't been willing to cooperate with for a long time until recently. I am not Darren. Darren T. Smith is Darren T. Smith. And that's all there is to it. And these are the stories that I can tell on a platform like this one. And that is part of what I'm trying to do here. Tell stories and make art. When we get right down to it, a lot of what I'm doing here is the product of a lot of opinions and being aware of a lot of things that have happened on YouTube. And in many ways, I feel like YouTube was much more of a creative outlet for a lot of different people. In other words, there used to be a lot of really cool stuff going on that I just don't see a lot of anymore. And because of the way that things have transpired here, a lot of that ability to do that feels a lot more inaccessible because now there's a standard, there's regulations, there's people that are upholding that standard that makes it feel like YouTube is this unreachable goal and people shouldn't even try it before they even get the idea. Not everybody has the money for a fancy camera. Not everybody has the money for an expensive video editing software. And because these things are what are set and upheld as the standard, it makes it so the average person isn't coming to YouTube. It makes it so creative innovation isn't being put forth on YouTube. And when it is, it gets staunched out and it gets stomped out. And even if that doesn't happen, it doesn't seem to go very far. There's a lot of cool stuff here. And I guess what we could frame this, what I'm trying to say is, YouTube is being greatly underutilized. I mean, for crying out loud, it's YouTube that was the appeal of the entire thing to begin with. And for all of the reasons that I've spent an exorbitant amount of time trying to articulate here, as well as many others that I'm probably not even aware of, or just have outright failed to mention, I think that's a goddamn shame. People should want to go for the thing if it's something that they want. People should be able to have a content creator that is putting out content that makes content creation seem more accessible. And I want to be one of those people. I want to be one of those people that through the content that I and my headmates create, we are able to inspire others to bring back an idea that I too can do it. I too can make content. And even though I don't have a whole lot of subscribers compared to other people, and I am only this far after being on this platform since the end of 2017, that's still more worth it to me. And even though I'm not where I thought I would be at this point, it makes it more meaningful to me. I would much rather make content like this for the rest of my career, so long as it's more meaningful. I don't need to progress at the expense of others when I am what I'm focusing on. And sometimes I am going to talk about what I love. And if there is something that I see that I think is unfair and a terrible criticism, I might take the chance to talk about it, such as I did with the Funky Frog Bait video. Though, by the way, that video was received, I don't think I'm going to do that for a long time, if ever. Personally, I feel as if art stagnates when it becomes formulaic. And even if there is a formula 
That doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. There are definitely pros and cons to formulaic concepts. They feel familiar to the viewer. It doesn't deviate too far from what other people are doing. That way, if you enjoy this person, you're gonna enjoy this person. And then you can find more relevancy in front of other people's faces when your content is a lot like others. It's not strange, it's not alien. And that is good for the productivity of simple designed content and for the retention and attention span of the audience that you're trying to cater to. To be clear, there's nothing inherently wrong with any of it. I just think that it is a shame and disheartening when that of which I am criticizing is what is being upheld because then there's not enough space for the people like me who just want to make content because it's what they love doing. And there is an importance to the way that I make content because I want it to inspire others by the vulnerability, by the simplicity, by the low quality. Because if I can do it, so can somebody else. And that's what I'm trying to do. Encourage art, encourage more people to make their own content if they want to, because I've been doing this this way for a long time, and although my projects have become more ambitious, I haven't deviated too terribly from the same simple setup. I am still utilizing a phone camera. I am still utilizing a cheap video editing software, and luckily, Thanks to somebody being generous enough to give me 60 bucks for Christmas in 2019, I was able to download and acquire a uh, software that I can record picture in picture to do comment responses as well as reaction style videos or some of the other content that I've done where we're focusing on the screen, but I'm still sitting there in the corner watching everything happen. There's a lot of content that can be created with very simple things that aren't terribly expensive. And I want that to be what's being put out there. And if nobody else is going to do it, then God damn it, I'm at least going to try. And I think that sums up the philosophy portion and the criticisms and the motivation and the driving force. But why do I do it? It's because I fucking love it. It is that simple, and it can be that simple. That's why I'm still here and still doing it, even with very little success after all of this time. That's it. It's because I love doing it. Period. And I want to be able to have fun with my audience. And I want to be able to give them something to go Easter egg hunt with by looking at some of the other content, by seeing what I've done before, and invite them in to what is the world's worst YouTuber, Jaquel. And on that note, I think I'm finally tying it off. If you're still here, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, take care and much love. All right, and what do we have here? Ah, and there we are.